The Torah reading this week is Parshat Vayishlach. And it's known as the section of the Torah which gives us guidance for confronting the world at large. As a matter of fact, very famously, when you look at the Book of Prime Ministers by Yehuda Avner, in July 1977, when Prime Minister Begin was traveling to, the, the, to Washington, D.C. and to meet President Carter and then ultimately to the Camp David meetings that led to the peace treaty with Egypt. So he stopped off famously in New York and he visited two famous rabbis. He visited Rabbi Salavechik from Yeshiva University and he visited the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And apparently it struck the world as so odd and so amazing to see the leader of a democracy and a state visiting rabbis. And the press was there and is actually a photograph I took out of the book. The photograph is here from July, 1977, showing Prime Minister Begin with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And the press kept asking, well, what did you talk about? Are they, you know, the usual rumors, are they in control? Are they really running the country? And basically what he answered is I came for a blessing. But afterwards, Menachem Begin said, both rabbis recommended, look at Parshat by Yishlach, this very Parsha we're doing this week, because this is the Torah portion to consult when you're looking at a confrontation with enemies of the Jewish people. Because what do we have here? We have the ultimate confrontation between Jacob and his brother Esau. We fast forwarded 20, 20 years 22 years since the blessings were given to Jacob instead of to Esau, Esau, and Jacob runs away and he gets married and he's coming back with 11 born children and a pregnant wife. And he's told that he's about to confront Esau. And included in this is also the very famous section of Jacob, Yaakov confronting the angel, the, the, which, which, and doing battle with the angel. I'm going to take a look at that as well. So this is the epic paradigm of the Jewish people in the form of Jacob confronting the enemies of the world at large. And parenthetically, it's worth noting that in Jewish thinking, we are today in this prolonged galut exile, which is considered the exile for the Romans, for the descendants of Esau, who we, we have been alienated, wandering the world for these past 2,000 years. And of course, today we have the hope and prayer that we can regather in the land of Israel and bring an end to this exile and in a certain way wrap up human history for the better. That's what we're going to look at. But I want to call your attention to something here. We are known as B'nai Yisrael. The world calls us Jews, which comes from Judah which was one of the two commonwealths at the time of the first temple were destroyed. And there's a whole history to why we're called Jews in the eyes of the world. Some people call us Hebrews, so it has a different background and a different meaning. But we refer to ourselves as B'nai Yisrael, the descendants of Yisrael. And we know that Yisrael is an alternative name for Jacob, for Yaakov. And that takes place in this week's Torah reading. So I wanna begin by looking at the text here I'm going to ask a question, and then we're going to go back, look at the Torah portion again, rethink this, and the title of this class is Spiritual Plans, Physical Plans, and how Jacob, the forefather of the Jewish people, shapes the future course of Jewish history in confronting the world at large. Let's begin with this very interesting contrast. Find my notes here. We're going to turn to page 177 in the art scroll, and that's chapter 32, sentence 28 and 29. And what we see there is the following. This is immediately after Jacob alone at the other side of the river, so to speak, on the eve of confronting Esau and his army that had come to challenge him to greet him, to challenge him, whatever the case might be. We don't know yet. And Jacob finds himself alone 
And the way the Torah puts it is a man, an angel struggled with him throughout the night. And the angel was not able to prevail against him. We're actually on, right, on page 177, I'm sorry. So with, as the dawn is breaking on the top of page 177, and Jacob says to this angel slash being that he has struggled with all night, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he, the angel, said to him, what is your name? He replied, Jacob replies, Jacob. And let's listen to what the angel says to him. This is his opposing angel. He said, no longer will it be said that your name is Jacob, but Yisroel, for you have striven with the divine and with man and have overcome. So here we have the moment in time when for the first usage in human history, where the name Yisrael is bestowed upon a human being, that human being being the person whose name, whose given name is Jacob, and his name becomes Yisrael, a grand name indicating that you have striven with the divine and with man, and you have overcome, you have prevailed, you have continued, you have emerged. A tremendous accolade. And we, why do we wrote, cherish the idea that Jacob acquires this new name and this name stays with us through history, as we're referred to in the Torah, as B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. And the answer is because Jacob was a towering being. His life is an amazing series of, of challenges that he overcomes. And we've already gotten through about a third of them or a half of them in this point in the Torah. And why is that so also? Because in the lineage of the Jewish people, when you look at the patriarchs, so Abraham was the founder of the Jewish people, founding us on the attribute of chesed, kindness, uplifting mankind, doing for others. Yitzchak, the second link, was gevura, self-mastery, control, being able to master his nature and himself and interact in the world on a very refined plane. And who is Yaakov? Yaakov is the is the Bechir Ha'avot, considered the choicest of the fathers of the Jewish people. Why? Because Yaakov integrated within himself all the greatness of Abraham and all the greatness of, of Isaac, his father. And he brought it to a whole new level. And he stood up ultimately for truth. And truth means totality, seeing the full picture of the world. And hence, he merits the name Yisrael, which is really the name that God originally in creation intended for all mankind. But as we know from what we've covered already this year in the Torah readings, that vision narrowed itself ultimately to Abraham and his descendants, given the responsibility to uphold the purpose of the world and therefore being chosen for the mission of enlightening the world to the purpose of the world. All this is there, it's bestowed upon him by this arch enemy angel who struggled with him all night to destroy him and couldn't prevail and tells him no longer will it be said that your name is Jacob, but rather Israel. Now, the truth be told, that's only the first time that his name was changed, but his name gets changed a second time. And if you turn to chapter 35, sentences 9, 10, 11, and, and where we would dance to here is Jacob is arriving in the city of Padan Aram. He's finally returned to the land of Israel on the top of page 188, 189 in the Art Scroll Chumash. Same time, God appeared to Jacob again when he came to Padan Aram and he blessed him. So it's a blessing from God. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not always be called Jacob but Israel shall be your name in the future. Thus he called his name Israel. Now, a little confusing, because we know when we look at the text of the Torah from now on, 
that sometimes he's called Yisrael, this grand name bestowed upon him. And sometimes he's called Yaakov, the name which connotes him holding onto the heel of his brother during birth, trying to rise above, struggle above, overreach something. So now let's just take a moment and here's the question that we're gonna ultimately try to solve at the end of this class. The question is, <laughs> Isn't God's blessing less than the blessing of the angel giving it to him? The angel said, your name is Yisrael unequivocally. When God comes to him and says, he repeats, your name is Yaakov. Your name shall not always be Yaakov. You'll also be called, you will be called Yisrael. And ultimately in the end of time, that's how you will be known. But in the meantime, the jury is out on which name you will have, this humble name of Jacob, of Yaakov, or this overarching grand name of Yisrael. So the question is this, why is God Almighty hedging God's bet on Jacob and telling him that sometimes your name will be Yisrael? In comparison to the angel that was trying to prevail against him, who says, no, unequivocally, your name is Yisrael. So we're going to try to solve that in the course of analyzing this Torah reading. If anyone has a question, please ask. But I hope that's a clear question. And it's, it's a stark contrast. And honestly, one that I really didn't notice until it was pointed out to me just recently in a class. And it sort of has shifted my whole focus on this week's Torah reading. So let's go back to page 170. In the outline of this week's Parsha, by the way, is as follows. We're talking about Jacob returning home after his exile and confronting Lavan and raising, having his, creating his family. As he's returning back, he's told that he's being confronted by an army of 400 men intent on making war with him, led by Esau. Yaakov prepares for battle, prays to God, sends a present to Esau, he has a three-pronged approach to dealing with the situation. That night he's left alone and he wrestles with the angel of Esau, the, the, the cosmic force that Esau represents in the world of opposition to good, and he earns the name Yisrael. Then they're actually gonna meet in reality, Yaakov and Esau meet, they're reconciled, they go their separate ways. There's a chapter about Dina, the youngest daughter, the daughter of Yaakov, being violated by the people of Shechem and what happens there. Then there's Jacob going on to Beit El, and that's the conversation we just had where God appears to him a second time and changes his name to Yisrael conditionally. And then he continues his travels. Rachel goes into labor. She gives birth to Binyamin. She passes away there. We discussed this last week's class. She dies in childbirth and is buried in the very spot that we know as Kever Rachel, as the tomb of Rachel that's on the road near Beit Lechem. And then the partial ends with the descendants of, of Esau. So let's look at the beginning. Page 170 in the Art Scroll, it's chapter 32, sentence 4. And Jacob sent angels ahead of him to Esau, his brother, to the land of Seir, the field of Edom. Now he hears that he's being confronted, and he sends ahead angels. Now, the word malachim is variously translated as angels or messengers. Rashi doubles down and says it means angels here. Why does Rashi say that? Take it into like a what we might think of as a, a heebie-jeebie metaphysical level. So Rashi has an argument. Rashi says, if you look back in the to the end of last week's Torah reading, it says, the last sentence, Jacob went on his way, this, traveling back toward the land of Israel, and angels of God encountered him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is a godly camp, so he called the name of the place Machanoim. So since the sentence before is referring to godly angels clearly, Rashi says that's what it must mean here. Now, this creates a context to everything we know about Jacob. Because after all, where did we meet Jacob at the beginning of last week's Torah reading? He fell asleep, he had a dream. 
and he saw angels going up the ladder and going down the ladder. We're all of a sudden becoming very angel centric in the life of Yaakov, in the life of Jacob here. The Torah is pushing that idea to the front of us. What does it connote to us? We're going to deal with this a little bit more at the end of the class, I hope. And if we don't, please remind me. But in other words, Jacob is on such a high spiritual level. His closeness to God is so intense. And he's not living in tents. And he's not settled in one particular place. So when he's on the move, he's surrounded by a heavenly host that is there to interact with him, protect him, watch over him, guide him. Words, he's living an above natural existence in his life where if he needs to send a message ahead, he can just summon angels who are sort of accompanying him and say, go forward, find out what's going on. They're going to report back to him, hey, it's a bad situation. Asaph is coming with 400 men intent on wiping you out. And that is the message he gets. So this is a picture, a picture that we don't readily identify and understand. But I hope by the end of this class, as we explain all these mysteries, we will really get there. But the introduction, Rashi saying that these are real angels, really ties the story of Jacob from the very beginning of his journey, when he leaves running for his life from his parents' home, all the way through the time he's living in Lovon's house, his return, his confrontation with Esau, and all the way till he comes to Beit El, and he builds this monument and God confers upon him a new name. Throughout all of this, he's, there's a spiritual dimension to his everyday existence, a palpable spiritual dimension. He gets the news that Esau is coming to attack him. Continue the narrative on the top of page 172, 173, chapter 32, sentences eight and nine, Jacob became very frightened and it distressed him. So he divided the people with him and the flocks, cattle and, and camels into two camps. And he said, if Asaph comes to one, strikes it down, the remaining camp will survive, they'll escape. And Jacob prays, he says, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, you told me to return to the land. You know, I've experienced tremendous kindness. Please help me. Um, you know, and he says, why in sentence 12? Rescue me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him lest he come and strike me down, mother and children. So clearly, this is an existential threat. And I'll tell you what Rashi explains to us. Rashi says, look, Jacob is a leader. He's leading a camp, a family that now includes a large number of people and wealth and servants. And they're slowly moving their way back to the land of Israel. That's the situation here. Jacob, in leading this camp, comes up with a whole strategy. Okay, we're being threatened. We'll divide into two camps. We'll position this camp over here, this camp over here. So the attacking army will have to choose which camp they're going to make war with. While they're doing that, the other camp can escape. So at least there'll be remnants of the family of Jacob who survived no matter what. And hopefully we'll prevail in battle. And then I'm going to pray to God for God's help and assistance. And now I'm going to send also an appeasement of Doron, a presence of sheep and oxen and all these special wealth that I have to soften Esau up, hopefully to blunt his intent to kill me. And yet he fears, he's distressed. So people question, why didn't Jacob just rely on the blessings that God had given him? Is he, why, why is he so fearful here? And to answer this and address this whole strategy where it's not simply a strategy that someone like Napoleon or Alexander the Great might have thought of, but rather it's a strategy that would be unique to a person like Yaakov, the Bechir Ha'avot, the person who's, who's the choicest of the patriarchs of the Jewish people, the person who is destined to carry the name Yisrael 
and convey it on to you and me and to the entire Jewish people. The person who lives a life where spiritual entities are interacting with him and opening his eyes to possibilities and guiding him, and he's living in such a way, is this simply strategic or is there something spiritual about it? And that's where we get the Beis Halevi very famously looking at these sentences and coming and highlighting two particular facts. And if you look at the text with me on page 173, you'll see them. First of all, it says, Jacob in sentence say, Jacob became very frightened and it distressed him. Now there are various interpretations of this. Rashi says, he was afraid that if there'd be war, he didn't want to be killed. That's what he was frightened of. And it would distress him to vanquish his enemy and kill others. But the Beis Halevi takes a different tack and says he's frightened on two completely different planes. And these insights are going to transform our understanding that Jacob wasn't a strategic genius here. It's not like he could become the defensive coordinator for the Chargers and help save their season. It was rather this multifaceted understanding of the physical world and the spiritual world and how these worlds connect together that informed him here. And the next thing the base of AV points out is just sentence 12, which says, rescue me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Asa, for I fear lest he come and strike me down, mother and children. Now, first of all, as the Beis Levi says, he only had one brother, so it could have said, he could have just said, rescue from the hand of my brother. We know that Asa, that's what he could have said from the hand of Asa. Why does he say both? So here the Beis Levi wants to open our eyes to a basic reality, and that is this. The opposition, the opponents of the Jewish people can take two forms. They can come to us like brothers and befriend us and therefore undermine our spiritual viability and continuity. Or they can come to us like an ace of a man of the field brandishing a sword and they can threaten our physical existence. That's the two prongs that we know from Jewish history that have, that have besieged the Jewish people. And I'll just mention it parenthetically here, and maybe we'll get into this more as we get into Hanukkah. But when you think about it, the Hanukkah miracle in defeating the Greeks, the issue there was the spiritual continuity of the Jewish people. The Jewish people were threatened by Hellenism. They were being prevented from observing their religion. There was no genocide. There was no intent on killing Jews. It was simply an intent on doing what Alexander the Great intended to do with the world, make us all into Greeks with one language and one culture, alienated from our God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that already is the brother coming to us and saying, I want to uplift you. I want to give you culture. I want to give you art. I want to give you literature. I want to raise you from this simple religious dimension of life. And I want to bring you into the fold of mankind. That's our brother attacking us. And Asa, we have all the other examples. It's actually the Purim story. Those are the two rabbinic holidays. Because in Purim, Haman was intent on murdering the Jewish people. That's all he wanted to do. He had no issues with observance. He didn't start up with us about anything else. He simply said, we're going to choose a day. And on that day, we're going to have a genocide. We're going to annihilate the Jewish people. We rule the world. We're going to eliminate them. From human history, which may have sound fanciful a hundred years ago to people, but having lived through the Holocaust, we see how, how that has been undertaken in such a ruthless, methodical way, documented by modern history. So now right away, the Beis Halevi has opened our eyes to the fact that Jacob is not covering bases. Jacob is saying that I, we are the Jewish people. We're in the cusp of becoming the Jewish people. We're a family. We're returning back to our land, the land of Israel. We're confronting the ultimate nemesis of our people. And we have to have our guard up in two particular ways. We have to pray and, and draw closer to God, lest our enemy undermine our religiosity and our connection to God. 
and we have to make war, be prepared to make war if necessary, because lest we become physically annihilated. And once defeated, obviously, we have no opportunity to fulfill our role through history and to be a light unto the nations and to inform the world and to fulfill the ultimate blueprint that God has for humanity. So these decisions that Jacob is making, inquiring what Asaph's all about, preparing for various eventualities, really needs to open our eyes for the way we prepare to live our lives and the manner in which we interact with the world at large, not out of fear and trepidation, but out of concern and with a forward thinking viewpoint of we have a responsibility to be the Jacobs of our time. We have our responsibility to propel forward the Jewish people to protect and to strengthen and to enable us to, to hold tight as we have throughout human history to representing to the world the lifestyle and the ideals and the values that the Torah contains. That's our job. And if we're going to do our job, if we're concerned of protecting that role, we have to do two things. We have to I'd be on our guard for those brothers, those enemies who come to us in sheep's clothing, forgive the irony here, and are out to woo us away from our, our purpose and our values. And we have to also obviously protect ourselves from those who come to physically destroy us and wipe us out. And that's what the two rabbinic holidays of Purim and Hanukkah are all about. And we'll talk about it more when we get to Hanukkah. So what we see here is an insight of, of the plane at which Jacob is living. Jacob's living on a plane where spiritual considerations are not fanciful. They're not a stretch. They're part of his everyday calculation. He carries a tremendous spiritual burden upon his shoulders to preserve the legacy of Abraham and Isaac. And in doing so, he's not just worried about war and opposition and germs and healthy living or whatever else you want to say. He's worried about protecting the spirituality and the physical existence of the Jewish people. And hence, when he prepares for a confrontation, he prepares for both. And in a way, I, I would dare say that if you put if we put ourselves in Menachem Begin's shoes as Prime Minister of Israel in 1977, getting on a plane, you know, meeting President Carter, going to this retreat and negotiating the future course of the Jewish people's homeland, as he did, you can see why it made sense for him to stop at these two rabbis' homes and why it made sense for these rabbis to say, Mr. Prime Minister, take a Torah, a Chumash with you. Keep your eyes on Parsha by Yishlach. Open your eyes to the physical risks that are involved. And as much as you want to create peace, open your eyes also to the spiritual risks that are involved so that you can preserve the Jewish people. And this really you know, is dealt with on many levels when you read the history of the, of the state of Israel and the different prime ministers that we have, but enough on the politics of it. So Jacob is frightened. And he's distressed. He's frightened by war. And he's distressed about how best to preserve and protect the ideals of the Jewish people. And how does this play itself out? Well, thankfully, in this case, when they meet, Esau uncharacteristically embraces his brother, um, speaks nicely to him. And then this, let, let's take a look on page 178, a conversation that they have together. This is Jacob and Esau after the confrontation, after the night in which Jacob struggled with the angel, and after their physical, actual meeting, when, when, when Asa surprisingly embraces Jacob. And here's how the conversation goes on page 178. It's chapter 32, sentence 20, one second. Chapter 33, sentence 12. And he said, here it's Asaph saying, travel on and let us go. I'll proceed alongside of you. Asaph here, after embracing Jacob, says, come, 
we'll travel together. We'll, we'll, we'll align ourselves as one. We're brothers. We'll connect. We'll travel the same road in life. We'll follow the same pathway. We'll live according to the same values. Sentence 13, but he, Jacob, said to him, my Lord knows that the children are tender and the nursing flocks and cattle are upon me, but they will be driven hard for a single day and all the flocks will die. Let my Lord go ahead of his servant. I will make my way at my slow pace according to the gait of the drove before me and the gate of the children until I come to my Lord and say, or eventually we'll meet, we'll meet up again. Seir is the home base of Esau. It's a place that perpetuates world dominance and lives by the sword. It's, it's almost the hill that Rome fashioned when the legions traveled forth and created the Roman Empire and suppressed the peoples and collected its booty and became the world power that it was. That Seir represents all that. And what is Jacob saying here? And this again opens our eyes to the whole context of the situation. Jacob says, you know, we're brothers, but you run ahead. You've got your ideas, you've got your ideals, you've got your wars to fight, you've got your lands to conquer, you've got your economies to build, you've got your world to dominate and peoples to suppress, whatever your agenda is. I've got a different agenda. I've got to go according to the pace of my children. It covers it up a little bit with his possessions, but I've got a family to build. I've got a people to build. I've got a legacy which is so different, which comes from the kindness of Abraham the personal gavura, the opportunity to master oneself that Isaac has bestowed on the world. That's got to be the pathway that I'm going to trod with my family. That has to be the education I'm going to give my children. That's my job. That's my priority. And it necessitates that I don't run alongside of you. But we'll meet up in the future. And what does Rashi say here? We'll meet up in the future. There's, there will be a time at the end of days, as referred to in other sentences in the prophets, when Seir, even this powerful hill of Seir, will come to recognize the sovereignty of God. And at that time, we could run along together, because at that time, our differences will be reconciled in the sense that the values that underpin the world will become clear to everyone. And hence, Rashi says, what does it mean when he says, until I come, my Lord, at Sayer, until I encounter you again? Of course, we're going to encounter him again, but not on our terms, on his terms. We encountered him during the Crusades. We encountered him during the Holocaust. We certainly had our encounters. But it means there, there'll be a messianic time. And at that time, we can integrate as brothers. Because at that time, you will understand and recognize the sovereignty of Hashem. And therefore, we can really become integrated as one. And, and there's other details here. The hour is a little late when we look at the actual fighting between the angel and Jacob. But I'm going to leave that out for this time. Rashi has comments there about what the word by ye or vake. And they struggled. They kicked up dust. How they were intertwined together. How they fought with one another. It's also many, many metaphors which have to do with the sense of preserving physical continuity and preserving spiritual continuity. And that's the hallmark of a Jacob. Now let's go back to our original question. And I'm gonna to try to pose an answer here. Maybe satisfying, maybe not so satisfying. We'll all think about it together. But we started off this class by contrasting the fact that the evil angel of, of Esau, who struggled all night long with Jacob, gives him an unconditional blessing. You're Yisrael. You're, you're the epitome of human spiritual achievement. And God later, when he encountered him later in Bethel, saying, you know, your name's going to remain Yaakov. It's also going to be Yisrael. Eventually, it'll only be Yisrael. But as we see from the Torah, it's going to be moved around. It's going to become sometimes one and sometimes the other. And here's an insight that's said by the Hassam Sofer, who poses this really mystifying question. He says as follows. When the 
opposing angel proposed to Jacob, just take the name Israel. You've earned it. You deserve it. He was saying, just become this spiritual being and forget about the fact that you have the wherewithal to struggle in a natural way as well. And those, those are the two names, right? Yaakov is the, is the baby clinging to the heel of his older brother, struggling to, to persevere spiritually against opposition. And Yisrael is the grand name of a being who has prevailed in a struggle with man and with God, who represents what ultimately the Jewish people are meant to represent. So the angel pulls a fast one here. And the angel says, you know, just make your name Yisrael. That's going to be your name. Just use that one name. Meaning what? So you'll forever be vulnerable. That in the natural world, when confrontations happen, when you do have to fight a war for physical existence, you'll be vulnerable because you'll be up in your ivory tower, you'll be in your lofty plane, and you'll lose that opportunity to do the natural preparations for life to be able to prevail. But God says, you know, there'll be a time for that, Jacob, but not now. Now you're going to have to remain a combination of a Yaakov who was able to live in the home of Isaac and Rebekah in contrast to a brother Esau who was out plundering and conquering and hunting. And you chose to study Torah and to, and to, and to refresh yourself with spirituality. And then you went to the house of Laban as a Yaakov and you were tricked and fooled and you struggled and you were, could, were gonna leave without only the shirt on your back, but then you managed somehow to have a blessing that you acquired wealth and you were able to go on from there. That's the Yaakov. That Yaakov is going to have to remain with us throughout human history. And only in the end of time will we blossom as, so to speak, purely spiritual giants without any need and without the necessity to prevail on that level. There's a Kabbalistic gematria calculation to this too which is that when you take the name Yisrael and the name Jacob together and you use the numerical equivalent of it, it adds up to the phrase, you can prevail against the Satan, you can prevail against the ultimate opponents of the Jewish people throughout history. It takes both names to do that. And at the end of time, once Esau accepts the sovereignty of God, and once we begin to live in a world like Isaiah prophesies, where the lion and the lamb will lay down with one another, and there'll be harmony and purpose in the world, then we'll be able to wear only our identity as Yisrael, as those who have stood up to the test and challenge of history and time and all the spiritual and physical adversity that we've overcome. And then we can rise in keeping with what the evil angel bestowed upon us. And we can only be Israel, but in the meantime, we have to be both. So this is Jacob. This is our Parsha. This is the complexity with which we have to interact with the world. We have to cover our bases. We have to celebrate a Hanukkah, where we overcame a world power intent on assimilating us out of existence so that we would produce sculpture and we will produce art and music as they were doing, but we would not be able to be beacons of morality and Torah and goodness and the word of God. We prevailed there and we celebrated with Hanukkah. And in Purim, just as we have unfortunately had to do in the 20th century, we prevailed against an onslaught of physical attack. And we, we're here today Building our Yisraels, our identity as Yisrael, this overarching identity, while at the same time coping with the Yaakov, the Jacob within us, coping with all the physical necessities of life that require us in order to prevail and in order to move forward. These are the lessons. And I could see an Israeli prime minister sitting down and taking this Torah reading seriously 
and then being in a better position to negotiate the terms of peace for the people of Israel, for the land of Israel, and hopefully for the world at large. Hopefully we can do the same in our own lives. We can assimilate these lessons. We can understand them better. We can learn when they apply and how to apply them, which is not an easy matter. And we can ultimately see ourselves emerge into a world where we can be Yisroel in the truest, purest, and most sublime sense of the name which we aspire to fulfill. Any questions? Thank you very much for being here. Have a good night. Thank you, Rabbi. It was a, 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 you did answer your question that you posed at, at the start, so thank you for that. I hope so. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.